Good evening, Indian Nations Baptist Church. Brother Kyle here with you once again. Glad to be with you this week for um, another Bible study, our weekly Bible study. Um, as you guys that have been participating and watching along with us or following along with us in our Bible studies, and I know some of you have uh, been participating with uh, in our Q&A uh, sessions, we've been uh, releasing some studies on Tuesday and then uh, having a Q&A about the study on Wednesday. But uh, this week, we're just going to release uh, the Wednesday night study because we have wrapped up our previous study about uh, spiritual unity, uh, particularly the, you know, focusing on the importance of uh, the unity in, in, within the church. And we are uh, one week out, well, less than a week out now. I mean, next week we'll be in the middle of uh, Indian Falls Creek and all of its uh, festivities that will be uh, partaking in and participating in, and I encourage you to do so. Um, if you haven't already set aside, made plans yet, you know, already, please do so. Um, Sunday evening is going to be the first night that uh, the uh, services will be kick, be kicking off, you know, be premiering on Sunday evening, and they'll go through, um, uh, all the way through Friday. So uh, this, year, this year is, of course, a very unique situation for, for Indian Falls Creek and many other uh, camps and uh organizations that uh, normally meet during a specific time. You know, a lot of people gather together and stuff. As you know, our, our tribal people have been affected through uh, our uh, annual dances that we have and, and um, uh, other gatherings that, that we're very used to. State fairs already closed. Schools are, you know, trying to make decisions. And, and uh, a lot of them, uh, my son's school, in fact, North Rock Creek, has recently released their plans and stuff. And uh, so there's just many things in life that uh, last year at this time uh, we weren't even you know considering having to make changes to or anything like that. And this year, you know, there's a lot of changes we're going through. So as you guys know, we're not going to be at camp for Indian Falls Creek this year, but uh, Indian Falls Creek is going to be hosting and uh, producing a virtual camp for us. And there's been a lot of folks uh, working in the background and. Um, organizing that for us on our behalf and everything and trying to get things um, squared away so that next week when we get kicked, we, we, we get started with everything, when everything kicks off for the week, we'll have our evening services like we normally do with Brother Mike, uh, Kibo, and of course um, uh, the uh, the band that will be playing with them, Joshua Street and everything for them, uh, leading us in worship and everything. But uh, we're also going to be, be able to have classes and stuff. So uh, our normal classes for the adults, for young adults and youth and and children and, and, and things like that will still be offered and stuff. And we're even doing a little bit of recreation still. If you've seen on the Indian Fall Street Facebook's post uh, recently, you'll see that there there's some things that you can participate in virtually, um, as well as you know some things from our special activities directors. They're, they're doing some things uh, for us as well. So um, next week, that reason I, I mentioned all that is because one, I'm excited for it. I, I hope you are too, and you're geared up with you and your family. We'll be able to uh, sit somewhere or find somewhere to, to participate in the classes and especially the evening services. I, I've been praying for Brother Mike and I, I hope you have too and our worship leaders that the Lord is really going to bless through this virtual experience that we have. And uh, we may not all be able to go to God's house, you know, the house of prayer physically in that tabernacle that we all love being at. But instead, we'll be able to uh, bring God into our homes, you know, our individual homes and stuff. And many churches are making plans to try to gather together to offer, you know, viewings uh, at, the, at their churches and stuff, because a lot of folks don't have, um, you know, a way of doing so in their own personal homes, where their, their cell phones don't have the capability or they don't have, you know, Wi-Fi or Internet services at home to be able to, you know, follow our live stream uh, for the services or uh, log into the classes or you know, those sort of things. So uh, churches are trying to provide and figure out those, those uh, needs as well. But this week, as I said, uh, it's going to be... Uh, you know, a particular type of lesson where we're only going to be meeting tonight for, for this. We're not going to be having an additional night of, of Q&A uh, sort of discussion afterwards. Uh, we'll, we'll resume that type of study uh, the week after Indian Falls Creek. We'll pick back up. Um, and I, I do ask you to pray in this particular way that the Lord will uh, uh, lead us in a, into a study that will build upon and, and continue on um, what I think we're going to be blessed by this upcoming week. And our, our theme for Indian Falls Creek this year is Awaken. And that's what I want to address tonight is really a study and an encouragement, if anything else, uh, that would 
prepare us for the upcoming week that we have coming up, this Indian Falls Creek week. Let's go, Lord, in prayer at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, for, Father, for this day. Lord, we thank you, Father, for this opportunity that you give us to, uh, by way through the, the, the internet and technology that we have today, to still get to gather and have a Bible study, Father, and still get to delve into your word. And uh, Lord, I ask that you just bless us tonight, Father, as we go into your word tonight. Um, the, these couple of passages here, as, as uh, it has been uh, my heart's desire and focus that I believe you've given me to help prepare us, not only myself, uh, very, that's very much needed, but also to share that with, with others, to encourage others and, and uh, instruct others what your word says and how we can prepare ourselves for upcoming things, Father, and, and the right mindset we need and, and, and place where our heart needs to be in order to, uh, indeed, as our theme says for Indian Falls Creek, be awakened. And awaken spiritually is our emphasis this year. So, Lord, bless us as we get into your word and study it. May you help us to understand and uh, may your lesson come across um, in, a, in a way that would uh, uh, bless those who are participating in it tonight, Father. But, Lord, also for those many of our loved ones, Father, of our church family and extended church family, our own personal families, Father, who are facing um, the issue of COVID-19 is very real for them and their families. We have uh, folks that we know that are, are, are suffering through this disease and this uh, the effects of this virus and families who are facing that effect as well. Um, it, it, so for some folks, it's not just one person in the family. It's affecting the whole household and such, Lord. So that whole household needs your hand of prayer, Father. But there's so many things out here, Father, that uh, uh, that is affected by this virus, Lord. Our frontline workers and, and those that uh, uh, are facing, you know, having to treat folks that are going through these uh or have contracted the virus and such, Father. Bless them, Lord. They need your help and protection. May you protect them and their families as they go home to. They don't want to uh, get the disease and take it home to their, their spouses and their children, Lord. And, Lord, we don't want that to happen, Father, as they're out there serving uh, their fellow uh, uh, people, fellow mankind, Father, and trying to treat them in, in dealing with the disease. But, uh, Lord, also, Father, for those that are decision makers from our health agencies to our political agencies, Father, and everything in between, Father, all the way down to the EMTs that come through our door to, to take us to the hospital and such, Father. Everybody, Father, that has uh, an ability to, to be a blessing in this situation now, um, help our leaders make good, sound, and wise decisions and compassionate ones for the people and not uh, about votes and those sort of things, Father, but Lord, let it be about really, truly the, the care of the people, the welfare of the people. And let them have compassion in their decision making. Let that be the overwhelming uh, thought process that they go through. What's best for the people and not best for their uh, political seat or, or power or anything like that or influence. But Lord, also at this time, as we get into our study tonight, we ask that you bless our pastor and his family, Father, as they continue to lead, guide, and direct us as the, the shepherd you've given us into our church family, Father. Bless him. Bless him and his health, his wife and uh, her and her dear health, Father Lord, and, and their entire household, Lord. Bless them, Father, for what they do for us each and every day, Father, and each and every week, Father. And all these things that we ask in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So, as I said, let's get into right into it. Um, Exodus chapter uh, 34, verse 14. Then we're going to jump uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. And if you don't have your Bibles, pause at, the, at this moment. Run and get them, bring them back, open them up, dial uh, uh, up on your phone, you know, open up the app or whatever, and find these these particular passages. They both, like I said, say very similar things, um, mm -hmm. and they are meant to be a blessing to us in this way, and uh, what uh, the Lord's laid on my heart, uh, how they are to bless us anyway. But this is Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. We're going to read it, and then we're just going to jump right over to 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, okay? Uh, Exodus 34, 14 says, You are... Never to bow down to another god, because Yahweh, being a being jealous by nature, is a jealous God. Keep that in mind. And let's now flip over to First Samuel, First Samuel chapter seven, verse four. And Samuel the prophet tells the people that were that are there. He says, uh, Samuel told them, "If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart." Get rid of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths that you that are among you. Dedicate yourselves to the Lord uh, and worship only Him. 
then he will rescue you from the hand of the Philistines. Now, let's go ahead and continue with, uh, uh, I read verse 3 there, but let's, uh, that's what I meant to, to get into, uh, chapter 7, verse 3. But let's go ahead and read verse 4, because it adds to it. It says that, so the Israelites removed the bales and the ashtoreths and only worshipped the Lord. So Samuel was saying there, you know, uh, if you are returning to the Lord and what he, so this gives us indication that they had left the Lord. Okay. They left following him. And he's saying, if you want to return to him, you got to get rid of these other things out here that you're worshiping. Asterisk, Baal, you know, uh, those were, if you don't know, those were uh, Canaanite uh, gods. Okay. Baal was thought of uh, uh, being t to be the god of, uh, you know, um, uh, the crops and things like that. Uh, he, was, he was thought to be a, a, he was a deity of the Canaanites, but he was regarded as the god of thunder and rain. Thus, he, he controlled vegetation. Okay. So, in a similar way, um, Ashtoreth, being a Canaanite god, uh, she was uh, the one who, who represented um, fertility. So they thought that the Israelites were joined in into the worship of the Canaanites' gods, and I use God and little g, okay, uh, little g. <laughs> um, they thought that worshiping these two gods, okay, these two gods coming together and worshiping them would bring uh, abundance back to their land. Wasn't working out. Didn't work out for them. We know why, of course. Because they're false gods. They're not real. They're fake. You know, there's no life to Baal or Ashtoreth. You know, they're man-made and created gods. They weren't the God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one true God. And it, it's him who they are acknowledging. And it, Samuel is helping us see that, that that's what's going on in this picture, that the Israelites are wanting to return. But he's uh, drawing a, a line in the sand, so to speak. He, he's sitting there drawing that line, and he's saying, you know, if you want to, if, you, if you're trying to return to the Lord, he says, with uh, you need to do so with all your heart. But he says, get rid of the foreign gods. And he names some of them specifically, of course, in verse 3. He says, the ashtoreths that are among you, dedicate yourselves to the Lord and worship uh, only him. He says, then he, then he will rescue you from the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites removed the bells and the ashtoreths and worshiped the, uh, uh, only the Lord. Worship the, only, only worship the Lord. Now, why these verses and why now in regards to next week in then false creek okay let me share this example with you okay that will help explain a little bit as to why some of you are old enough and maybe those of you who are on a younger side maybe uh you uh are film buffs you know and you know of a man uh, that was very famous and in in popular in the 60s and 70s especially he was an african-american actor named by the name of uh, Sidney Poitier. Uh, he uh, was very well respected, and rightfully so. Very part of some very um, important films and things like that as far as their content, their message, and things uh, like that. But uh, one of his films that he made was called uh, Lily of the Fields. And um, in that movie uh, that starred Mr. Sidney Poitier, there was uh, this other character that was a businessman in town. And that businessman happened to be an atheist. And uh, there was this exchange between uh, Mr. Portier's character and the businessman that uh, came, uh, came about because the town started to come together in this film. The town, uh, townspeople started to come together to work on and build this new chapel for the nuns of the local Catholic church. And so townspeople started coming together. They felt it was a worthy cause and stuff. And, of course, they're building, you know, a house of the Lord uh, for these nuns that are there. This, this this new little chapel for them. Well, uh, Sidney Portier happens to his character, looks looks over, and he noticed that the businessman's there, this atheist. Now, atheist, in case just to be clear with everybody, or for everybody, is somebody who uh, denies that there is a God. He doesn't believe. That, that person, uh, that atheist, is a person who does not believe that there is a God. Plain and simple. Simple definition and answer. Okay? So, uh, this man was a professed non-believer in God. Okay? A uh, atheist. And a known atheist. And, and um, uh, Sidney Portier's, uh, Mr. Portier's character had seen him and seen that he was there helping to, you know, come together with the other townspeople to build that chapel. And it struck 
uh, Mr. Poitier's character kind of funny. He was like, you know, what, you know, this is a weird sight or situation to see this man who uh, professes to, you know, not believe in God. All of a sudden, he's, I mean, he's here helping build this this new little church, this this little chapel for the nuns, the very, you know, some 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 servants of God that he doesn't believe in. What's what's going on here? So he comes up, he approaches them, and he says, "I thought you were an atheist." And the businessman replied. I am. Yes, I am. And uh, <laughs> Mr. Portier's character, he said, but uh, I don't understand. Uh, you're up here building a house of God. The businessman said, yes, I am. And uh, Mr. Portier's character again replied. He says, uh, why would you do that? You're an atheist. And <laughs> the businessman replies, just in case. Well, <laughs> uh, you see, that's what, unfortunately, we do, is if you caught what the uh, businessman was doing there. He didn't believe in God, but just in case he was wrong, he wanted to put in a little work, you see, to show in good faith, like, well, you know, I didn't believe in you, but you know, at least I helped your people just in case he turns out to be wrong, right? That That's the... The premise here, the situation in this uh, particular scene and, and acknowledgement by this character within this scene of this film. But I said that's the, I made this statement a moment ago that you might have caught and maybe it kind of stepped on your toes a little bit. But so but hang with me and let me explain when I said that that's what we do. Uh, the thing is, we keep other gods, little G, in our back pocket. Just in case, just in case, you know, uh, God, big G, doesn't work out. We want a sort of backup plan, so to speak. Okay? And we keep idols tucked away to be able to pull forth and use at our disposal when, you know, things with God don't work out. Since we hang on to certain people, places, things, just to cover our backs, so to speak, to use that expression. In the event God doesn't work out, okay, just in case in the event that God doesn't work out, we want to keep those in our back pocket to have at our disposal, like I said. In the Bible, God was, and we see this in, from what Samuel's statement is, God was never satisfied OK, he was never satisfied with partial commitment, half hearted commitment. He would just or, or any fraction less than 100 out of 100. OK, less no, no percentage less than 100 percent of your commitment. He was not satisfied with that. He's not satisfied with you giving 99 percent to him and 1 percent to others. We read that a while ago in what is stated in Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. And then also here at what the, the challenge or the statement, the uh, uh, lesson or the teaching moment that Samuel took for the, the Israelite people, um, the Jewish people, to say to them that they had to get rid of their uh, false gods. It says you can't, you, you can't do that. You can't have even... a. a a portion that you're trying to share with God what belongs to God. And what belongs to God from us as his people is commitment. And this is why I bring out this in regards to our theme and our upcoming week of Awaken, is that it is the earnest prayer of so many of our leaders, our, our, especially our uh, Native American leaders or our, our leaders who work with the Native American communities to try to reach them for the gospel. We want an awakening within our ministry and ministries with our individual churches and such. But the overall ministry, it would be an awesome thing to be a part of, to, to experience, to behold. The, the, the overwhelming majority of, of Native American professing Christians giving a wholehearted commitment to God. But see, that that's the thing that I, I'm praying about and why I'm bringing this particular couple of passages out 
ahead of time before we get to Sunday evening, the first, the very first start of the services for the rest of the week. And we're blessed this week because we're going to have six nights of service rather than five, and we're going to have five days of classes rather than four. So in this unique opportunity, we're already being blessed with at, with additions of, of, of extra days of classes and stuff. And that's one thing I think I've heard over the years is in, in Falls Creek, man, is the week is so short. You know, it goes by so fast. You know, we have five evening services, four days of classes and activities and events and things. Well, we get a whole extra day doing things virtually. And I know it doesn't quite make up for being there, but guess what? God is still blessing. We can't focus on what we're not receiving and uh, just completely miss the blessing that God is trying to give us. Well, I don't care. I'm still, we're not at camp, but I'm still not going to be happy. And, uh, you know, I'm going to pout, I'm going to fuss, and I'm not going to participate on that online foolishness or whatever else, that online business, because it's not the real Indian Falls Creek. Trust me, folks, when I say to you this, the God of Indian Falls Creek, the, of our people of Indian Falls Creek, is real, no matter whether it's in the tabernacle that we worship or in your home that you worship. He is still real, okay? No quotation marks there. He is, he is real, okay? Whether you feel like Indian Falls Creek this year is going to be real or not, you know, the thing is, is that we have to look at the blessings God is trying to give us, even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of a troubling and trying time, even in the midst of folks that would normally be with us, strong, healthy, singing, uh, preaching, leading in tribal hymns, teaching and uh, playing ball and, and whatever it may be, you know, uh, having good fellowship, eating in, in tacos on Indian taco night. Man, that's one thing I'm going to miss. We might have to do it here at home, you know. And uh, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, yes, we're going to miss out on those things. And there are folks that are going to be missing out on those things because they're dealing with the coronavirus, the COVID-19 themselves specifically. We may not. You know, it may not be touching you or your home, but it may be touching others and theirs. It definitely is. I know some, you know, we got some pastor friends and their families that are going through it right now. Others that are being reported that a pastor's son and, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the dad he, and, and his wife are experiencing or exhibiting some of the symptoms and stuff and uh, haven't uh, come back with uh, results from the test or anything, but it looks like they could have it as well. You know, these are beloved uh, family members of ours, when I talk about family, I mean, you know, of God's family, our, 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 our native Christian families and, and community that, that they're a part of and stuff, and they're dealing with it. They wouldn't be at camp with us this year if we had the on-site camp. They'd still be in a hospital or still be in quarantine at home and everything. The virtual camp gives everybody, even the, a sick person that's in the hospital, the ability to flip on a laptop or open up their phone or whatever and uh, tune in to what God is going to pour through their screen in a way of blessing. But here's the thing. One of the things that we have to get correct before we want any kind of spiritual awakening. When Samuel is saying to the people here, if you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then get rid of your foreign gods and the asterisks that are among you and dedicate yourself to the Lord and worship only him. But that's the problem that so many of us face is that we want our answers to come how we want them and expect them to. And when God doesn't show up in our timeline or time frame or even answer in a way that, you know, he, we want him to, let's go back to Indian Falls Creek real quick. Many were praying that we still get to have camp. And there are those that might be so stubborn, so hard uh, uh, hardened of heart that because we're not going to get to go to camp, like I said a while ago, they're not going to participate in the virtual opportunity. God is sitting there trying to provide a, a way to provide a blessing. He opens up this, this new door, new path for us to be blessed by. And there's still there are folks standing at in front of the other door that's been closed this year. There, you, can, you can literally drive down Sunday and park outside the gate. And you're going to be missing out on the blessing because 
God isn't blessing through what's past that gate this year. Normally he is. You go through that gate, you 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 go to the classes, you go to the sanctuary or the tabernacle and stuff, and man, you're going to be blessed. That's that's how it normally goes every year. But this year you can go to that gate and you're going to miss out on a blessing because God ain't coming through that gate this year. God's blessing is not through that gate of Indian Falls Creek or that wonder, those wonderful twisting hills that scare people <laughs> as you're driving up to, you know, the, the old way, the, the, high, the, the high end way up there. You know, and those cliffs and everything like that. You know, you, you, you get the excitement and stuff that builds whenever you're driving and making your way. And it just starts to build up and it's like, oh, we're almost there. We're almost there. Think of the cabin and all that kind of stuff or, and, and uh, the classes, the ICs and, you know, for those of you that are single, you know, the snags and whatever, <laughs> whatever else that you may uh, have on your mind. But you know what? All those things that may attract folks, God brings them there because he wants them there to be with him, to experience a week with him. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us to do so because we're limited on our phones in technology use. No TVs, no radios and stuff like that. I remember back when uh, in the Falls Creek used, used to be in June and uh, there were uh, a few years where the NBA finals were going on. And I didn't learn who actually won the championship until Indian Falls Creek was over. <laughs> or somebody that, you know, went and found out somehow would share with you, whatever. But thing is that normally I'd be watching. I, I'm a, I love sports. I grew up watching football and basketball and all these things like that. And I would watch the NBA Finals all the time. Sometimes the playoffs and the finals would be going on while we're at uh, Indian Falls Creek. And I would miss out on seeing it. But you know what? Missing out on seeing that meant I was completely there with the Lord that week. And that's what he wants from us. And that's what he wants from us going into this week is a complete commitment. If we want true spiritual awakening, Samuel is saying here, if you want to return to God, that's what an awakening will do. It's a return from sleep to awaken. You go off to sleep, lay in your bed, you know, whatever else you drift off to sleep. You're, you know, uh, out of consciousness and everything like that. And you wake up, whatever else you are restored, you are refreshed, you are re uh, reawakened from being asleep. If we want to be awakened, Paul, the way that uh, Samuel, excuse me, describes it here. If we want to return to God, then the way he describes it says, with all your heart, if you are, uh, let me go back and read this again. If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, he says, get rid of, get rid of the foreign gods. Get rid of those other things that you rely on in God's place. Like I said, he's not going to, be one that's satisfied with 99 out of the 100. He wants your entire commitment. Nothing less than 100% is satisfying to him. He wants 100% of your commitment. That's what's required. That's what's drawn in the sand. I said Samuel's drawing a line in the sand. He says, you step over this line, you're willing to give your 100% commitment to him. If you stay across that line, that means you're not. And you can't return to him. He says, you step forward, you're making the action of stepping forward and returning to God, but it requires a 100% commitment. He says it in this way, with all your heart, all, 100%. That's the equivalency there, all 100%, 100 out of 100. That's what God wants from us. So if we want to be uh, people who experience an awakening, we got to give our all back to him. And you think about it. Think about it. What are the people or person, you know, the places, the things that you put before God? That you even look to for answers instead of God. Now, Let's, let me close by saying this because I don't want anybody misconstruing or misunderstanding what, what, what's being said here, okay? We can't fail to experience God's blessings by looking for answers that we think should come or the way that we think they should come. You know, not either by the answer or how the answer or when the answer comes. It's up to God. That's the part where we studied a couple weeks ago 
about him being sovereign. He is sovereign. He doesn't answer to us. He's not beholden to us. So when he gives his answer, that's his answer. You know, but the thing is that so many times when he does give an answer, we're too busy looking for it in a different way. There's this uh, pretty common example or, or, or uh, illustration that a lot of ministers use, and it's, a, it's used because it's a good one. There's a man drowning, and um, uh, out in the ocean and stuff, and he's treading water, and he's getting tired, and all that kind of stuff, and he just he, he's starting to question how much longer he can keep it up. Well, there's this boat that comes by, throws out a life preserver, you know, on those big old tubes, you know, and throws it out to him on, on a rope and says, grab a hold, the guys on uh, on, on the boat say, and, and uh, we'll pull you forward. He goes, no, 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 I, I, I've been praying, and, uh, you know, my God's going to save me. Go, you, you're okay. Thank you anyway. You know, these other guys uh, come by, uh, and a little skiff and everything, they offer to pull him up out of the water into their little boat. And uh, he says, no, 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 uh, you know, uh, thank you anyway, you know, but uh, I've been praying and, and, and God's going to provide uh, my help. He's going to bring, he's going to give me an answer. You know, he'll provide and he'll save me. Well, uh, the thing is, is that uh, that man goes on to drown. And as a story and illustration goes, you know, he uh, goes before the Lord. And he says, Lord, why, why didn't you save me? You know, people came by and I even told them. You know, that's how much faith I had. It was like, go ahead, go on by. You know, my God is going to save me. I have so much faith in him. You know, that he's He's not going to uh, uh, let me uh, just squander out. He's not going to let me drown. He's going to save me. So, so, you know, whatever. I told everybody that. You know, I was willing to profess that you knew how that's how much I believed in you. But why didn't you save me? And God responds to him. He says, but I did. I sent you help. You asked for help, and I sent you help. I sent one boat by, and when you didn't want to accept their help, well, then, you know, I, I gave you another chance. I sent, to, you know, these other guys by, hoping you would uh, accept their help. But, you know, you passed them both by, both opportunities, and then you drowned. That was me sending help. Why were you blind to my kind of help? So when God is trying to offer us help, but we're too busy thinking that it's got to come this particular way or this particular way or at this particular time, we have to make sure that one thing is resoundingly clear. We're willing to have faith enough to accept. If we have faith enough, as that man said he did, I have faith in God. Well, if we have faith in God, then we have to have faith enough to accept his answer in his way of help. Real day illustration. There's this issue about the masks that are going on. Do I wear a mask? Don't I wear a mask? The pros of wearing a mask, the cons of wearing a mask. I'm somebody who's uh, uh, immunocompromised, that's what they call my immunity is compromised because of you know the cancer and the chemo I've been through and everything like that. So I'm much more at risk, a much higher risk of catching this disease than uh, you know a strong, healthy person. You know, is that's just the, the reality of what the medical folks say. So I wear a mask and, you know, even before the uh, uh, pandemic started, I was wearing a mask because it wasn't just coronavirus or, you know, COVID-19 that I had to worry about. It was just somebody with a cold or a flu or some other sort of infection that if I transacted, you know, uh, uh, contracted, excuse me, what they had, it would be detrimental to my health. So before people were met, were wearing masks or were quarantining you know, staying at home and, you know, washing up good and all kind of stuff. I was doing that already. My family was doing that already. They were cleaning the house, wiping stuff down on a regular basis and everything like that with, you know, uh, the Clorox wipes and Lysol or whatever else, just trying to get rid of any germs that dad could end up contracting, you know, and could be detrimental to his health. So I know the perspective of wearing a mask even apart from the coronavirus and the pandemic. But the issue at hand is that some people out here aren't believing our medical folks because they think they know better. They're like that man. They remind me so much. And if this upsets you, I'm sorry. But I see you if you're a person like that, that is a mask denier. My goodness. But if you're somebody that is along that way, uh, falls along that line, you're like the man that's in that water to me. 
God has tried to offer you help. He's the doctors are telling you, wash your hands, social distance, stay home. Don't go out anywhere unless it's absolutely necessary. Wear your masks in public or whatever, wherever you go and such. And if people would do that, they all have said, we'll start to see the numbers decline. And you know what? The proof is in the pudding because other countries that have actually done that, where the majority of the population did that and followed those guidelines, they are seeing a major decrease in the cases of people, the number of cases of people who are infected with the disease. But some, for some reason, our folks here, it becomes a political thing. It becomes a thing about our rights. Well, I have the right to not wear my mask and you can't tell whatever, you know, it's my constitutional right. You know what? There was a, a post that uh, came across that I completely agree with. It was there's so much wisdom in what this person's words say. You know, first, they made the point that, you know, when you go into surgery, your doctor scrubs up really good. <laughs> they sit there and scrub. If you've seen any of those doctor shows, and before any of them go into surgery like that, you see them sitting there scrubbing underneath their nails, whatever else, all over every crevice, every little wrinkle in their hand, whatever. They scrub for, for several minutes, and they wash clean. They don't touch anything. They hit the door to walk in, whatever else, you know, all that kind of stuff. They don't touch anything because they don't want their hands to be contaminated by anything. They put a mask on while they open up somebody in surgery to do work, to do medical work and help that person. And the thing is, if, if a doctor does that in order to keep you from being infected, doesn't it make sense that you wear a mask to not keep other people from being infected, to help them, you know, prevent them from being infected? You know, you don't have to uh, wear a seatbelt if you don't want to. So, I mean... No one's going to stop and, you know, snap you in place. But guess what? The, the law requires it and you do it. You know, just last year, a month from from this year, you know, excuse me, a month ago this year, this this month, excuse me, a year ago this month. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> last July, I was involved in a wreck. And I almost T-boned this young lady that pulled out in front of me. She, I was on the other side of this other car. She pulled out. You know, she should have seen me there. You know, she would uh, was not in the right to pull out like she did. And, and um, she was a young young person, young driver. I got chalk it up to inexperience and stuff. But I still to this day have it so vividly in my mind that I could have T-boned her. You know, I seen her come out. And I still see her sitting in that driver's side window so clearly. And she was smiling at first because she had a passenger with her. And uh, they just left this little fast food place, sandwich place. And they didn't. there was a car over here to my right. They're trying to beat that car out, but they didn't see me on the other side of this car coming up together as we left. We're, they just left the light and stuff. Uh, me and this other little truck. But when she did, the, the terror on her face, I turned as quick as I could away from her so I wouldn't be uh, heading directly into the side of her, uh, her vehicle. And I end up hitting her engine on the front side uh, side of it hit or corner of it hit you know the front of my car my airbags went off but you know what other thing i was wearing i was wearing my seat belt which kept me in place and it, it it kept me in place so well that my face as a lot of people they come out looking all beat up black and blue and everything because the airbag beats them up <laughs> you know it can't come pops open or whatever else a lot of people smash into it whatever that didn't happen with me my seat belt man it worked kept me in place boom you know I was, it just held me there safely the worst I had was, you know, some issues with my back after that. But what I'm saying is it could have been a whole lot worse if I wasn't wearing my seatbelt. It's there for our safety. That's what the professionals say. That's what the health people say. You know, the safety people, excuse me, when it comes to those sort of things. The seatbelt works. You know, it, it helps in cases of a lot of crashes. There are some, yes, some of those, you know, cases that, you know, a very, very small percentage of them that say, well, in this particular case, the seatbelt didn't help. But the overwhelming majority of instances and situations or cases is that it did. The same thing could be said about this mask. Now, what I'm saying to you is this, well, how it ties in, I'm not trying to beat up anybody about the mask. What I'm saying is God has offered us help. He's offered us people who have the wisdom to turn around and tell us, and we have it accessible, you know, our Indian health clinics, they have them for people. You know, there are other organizations that are uh, uh, 
uh, donating masks and such, or uh, get, trying to find people soap and you know hand sanitizer and those sort of things, so we can all stay healthy. People, my daughter was one of them. I shared that with y'all several weeks back. She was one of them. I was proud of her. She uh, had the um, determination and, and uh, got up the had the drive, the motivation to go and make masks for people. As the masks were, were having a shortage of them at that time in our country, and uh, they were saying that our hospital workers and such were need, in great need of them and were uh, in short supply of them. So my 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 daughter made a bunch of them out of uh, fabric and you know elastic and stuff. She got out, broke out her grandma's uh, sewing machine, and put it to work. And the thing is that it's supposed to be to benefit somebody else. God has offered us help. But many times we see help come, and because it doesn't come in the form or the image or the way that we expect God to help us, we miss it. It goes by. Any false treats coming up. God has offered us a new avenue to be blessed this year through virtual camp. You know what you can do? You can't maybe have afforded last year to pay for somebody's way that couldn't go. Maybe they wanted to go, but, you know, uh, you know, uncle or auntie, brother, whatever, I, I want to go to camp, but I, I don't have the money for the fee and all that kind of go. Well, first of all, if y'all ever come across somebody like that, when we get back to traditional camp, you let me know and I will do my absolute best to find them a way to go. I try to do that every single year. Somebody wants to go, I hear about that, you know, finances is the issue. I, I My wife is the same way. We've turned over every rock that, you know, possible to shaking every couch and cushion out, whatever that we have to find and scrounge up. We've called and, 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 and uh, visited uh, people that uh, could sponsor folks, and we've made uh, 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 it possible through the generosity of others some, a lot of times for people to be able to uh, um, make it to camp. But you know what? Perhaps somebody would have asked you this year, I, you know, um, I like to go to camp, but I can't afford the fee. Well, guess what? This year... That's not the case for any of us. We can all go to camp. You know, we just need internet connection. We just need uh, to get it through our phone, through our, our, our uh, uh, computers and such. And if we have people in that case, because I know there are some of our folks at home that don't have them, that's where we can step up and help as a church. You know, invite them. Hey, you're going to participate in the Falls Creek this week, this year? Our theme is Awaken, and man, God's really going to bless. But I might keep on preaching. Oh, I'd like to, but I don't have internet at home. You know what? Keep uh, let me keep that in mind, whatever else. I'm going to help me let me see if I can't figure out something with my church to help come to a solution for that. And, you know, don't just walk away saying, oh, OK, I'm sorry. I'll pray for you. You know, that's what we say a lot of times. And I don't mean to be detrimental to that or anything or tear that expression down. But what I'm saying in this particular situation, we can actually do real, you know, physical help in this way. We can pray for them, but we can actually go out and physically help them as well and help them get connected. That's how we can bless. That's how we can bless this year. Maybe you couldn't afford to uh, sponsor somebody, but this year you can direct people to the virtual camp and what all God has in store for us. I'm praying for a spiritual awakening. I'm trying to ready my heart because I'll be honest with you, over this past several months, there are times where I haven't been 100% committed. And I want to be awakened within my spirit. And as Samuel says here, what's required, what's required is that you return to the Lord with all your heart. And to do so, you have to get rid of the foreign gods. He's not talking about just foreign as, you know, across the border. He's talking about anything that is not God. Anything. It could be anything. Your phone, TV, sports it can be uh people you know it, it, it's children or a husband that you put ahead of god you know if you really want to love them you'll put god first you know it's your job it's money whatever it may be a place a thing whatever if you're putting it before god you can't return to him and you can't expect any kind of a spiritual awakening so i encourage you and i challenge you as we uh, reflect upon this lesson, you know, in Exodus 34, 14, it was put to us in such a way that sounded similar to Samuel, but in Exodus it says, you are never to bow down to another God because Yahweh, being jealous by nature, is a jealous God. That's where that song comes from that says he is jealous 
for me. Our world takes that expression and makes it evil, a bad thing. But think about that. God is jealous for you. He don't want anything in that way. He doesn't want to share you with anybody because you are his. And the way scripture puts it, he is ours. We don't have to share him with anybody either. He can be 100% ours. You know, yes, we all share in the family of God, but I'm talking about my relationship with him. He doesn't put me on hold for anybody else. He doesn't put me on a back burner for anybody else. He says, Kyle, you are most important to me. And I believe that and I trust that. Why? Because he sent his son to die for me. He showed that type of love and expression of love for me. I can love him back with all that I have. And he loved me with all that he has. I pray that this lesson tonight will be an encouragement and a blessing to you as we get ready to move forward uh, for Indian Falls Creek. And pray, I hope you'll be praying for a spiritual awakening within your life, within our church, and within our entire Native community, Christian community, Native Christian community around the world. All of them that might be uh, tuning in all across the country, not just in Oklahoma, but everywhere. Spread the word. Get on Facebook, you know, Instagram, wherever you have to do. Uh, call up people. Text them. Hey, say, tell them, you know, uh, get connected with Indian Falls Creek on Facebook. Look them up, Indian Falls Creek or IndianFallsCreek.org, you know, and they can watch this the, and participate in the classes and the, the services and everything like that also. Get the word out. Help somebody. Bless somebody by steering them and directing them towards Indian Falls Creek. God bless you, church family. I love you. And I can't wait to see how God blesses. Amen.